All right. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Today will be my next lesson on accounting. Today, specifically, I will be talking about networking capital. So first, let's review a little bit from last time. Last time, I talked about the three financial statements and how they give us an idea of a business's future cash flows, along with the riskiness of those cash flows. I've been talking a lot throughout this entire lecture series about how the most important sentence of finance is that the value of any asset or business is the present value of its future cash flows. So the three financial statements, which a business or a public company has to report four times a year, really give us an idea of a business's future cash flow generating activities, so the future cash flows, and then the riskiness of the, those cash flows, which goes back to the time value of money where we're discounting back these cash flows back to present value. Another thing I talked about is accrual versus cash basis accounting. So I talked about how on the income statement, which is one of the three financial statements, we use accrual based accounting. In, income statement at a high level shows all of the revenues a business is generating and then all of the costs that are directly incurred as a result of you know generating this revenue and accrual basis accounting basically means that everything must occur during a certain period or it's not reflected on the income statement so the income statement only reflects the goods or service that you're actually producing during that period not the cash that you're receiving for revenues so if I get prepaid $100 for revenue three years from now, it won't show up as revenue even though I'm generating that cash. It will only show up as revenue once I actually provide the good or service. So cash accounting would be the opposite. It would be just showing when your business is receiving cash and losing cash and not so much when it's actually like generating revenue or actually incurring costs. And then another thing is three financial statements are very interconnected. So here's a review of the three financial statements. You can see here on the left, we have the income statement, which again at a high level shows all the revenue that a business is bringing in and then all the costs. And then this gets us to a net income, which is basically revenue minus all of these costs, which could be like depreciation, cost of goods sold, taxes, interest expense. And this gets us to a net income. Then you over to go to the cash flow statement, which unlike the income statement is completely cash based accounting. So it's showing all of the cash that is entering and leaving our business. So we have three sections of the cash flow statement. Check, most notably, which we'll be talking about today, will be cash flow from operations. And then on the bottom left, we have an example balance sheet here. The balance sheet shows uh, basically the core accounting formula, which is uh, assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. So assets, which are all of the things a business has that generate future economic value, that equals all of the liabilities and shareholders equity. So it's basically a business has all of these assets, which generate future economic value. And then the liabilities, which are things a business owes to an external third party and shareholders equity. These are basically the claims on a business's assets, which I've been talking about a lot throughout these videos. We go you know, talking about like debt and equity. But anyways, just wanted to review these three financial statements. Today specifically, we will be talking about networking capital. So networking capital is just a business's current assets minus current liabilities. And it's a measure of a company's liquidity and short-term financial health. So examples of current assets include cash and cash equivalents, accounts receivable, inventory, and prepaid expenses. Um, just a reminder, um, current assets assets, which you can see shows up on the balance sheet here, are just assets that can be liquidated in the cash in less than a year. So all these are good examples of that. Accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses, and then you just have cash itself. And then current liabilities are the same thing. These are, uh, you know, things owed to external third parties in less than a year. So this includes accounts payable, prepaid expenses, deferred revenue, short-term debt, which is debt that you know matures in less than a year, and then dividends payable, which would be like dividends that a business promises to its stakeholders that it hasn't paid out yet. And ideally, a company will have positive networking capital. Not having positive networking capital can be a sign that a business is in distress, right? This means that a business doesn't have enough assets that can be generated in the cash within a year to cover all of the things it owes to third parties within a year. Obviously, this is not a good sign for businesses. You know, if you were a business, what would you do if you were in distress? You would probably go to all the people that owe you money and be like, hey, give me my money. I need my money because you have a lot of things that you owe. You need that cash to fulfill those obligations. And you would probably also stretch your obligations as far as you could. You could probably, you probably, 
if you owed someone money, you'd probably be like, hey, man, please just give me 20 more days. I need 20 more days. So you'd be stretching out these liabilities and trying to turn your, your current assets into cash as quick as possible. So distressed companies oftentimes you'll see they don't have much accounts receivable, but they have a lot of like accounts payable and accrued expenses, expenses they've incurred, but they haven't yet paid yet because they're, you know, really stretched for cash essentially. So a business would like to have a positive net working capital. And then net operating working capital, this is just operating current assets minus operating current liabilities. You'll excuse me, I'm a little bit sick today, but I'm trying my best. So the short-term assets and liabilities involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a business. So unlike just net working capital, this is only the assets and liabilities that are directly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a business. So these are created because of the discrepancies between things being incurred versus things being paid in cash. So for instance, accounts receivable, which is a current asset, the only reason that exists is because sometimes we'll you know, provide a good or service, but we won't get paid for it in cash yet. If we lived in a world where everything was paid for in cash immediately, these current assets and current liabilities wouldn't really exist, right? So that's like the main reason behind all of these. Um, and things like dividends payable, for example, would not be you know, an operating current liability because it's not really related to our operations. It's more so something that has to do with like financing, you know, same with short-term debt or just cash itself. It's not really related to our operations, what's really driving value and what are like, we're really trying to do as a business. Um, so some operating current assets, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses, accounts receivable. This is just cash your business is owed for a good or service that it is already provided. So if I'm a lemonade stand, and, um, you know, if someone buys $20 worth of lemonade from me, but they say, I'll pay you next month, Carter, then that would be $20 of accounts receivable. Someone owes me $20 for a good or service I've already provided. Inventory, same thing. This is just an item that a business paid for that it sells as a part of its core operations. This is something a business can ideally get, you know, liquidate into cash within a year. So that's why it's a current asset. Prepaid expenses, this is operating expenses a business has paid cash for, but not yet incurred. So maybe I pay my entire rent for the entire next year. This would be an asset for me because now instead of having to pay rent every month, I've already paid for it. So this is a current asset in a way because now these you know expenses I'm incurring the next year, I'm not having to actually pay cash for them. So that's definitely an asset for me. And in current liabilities, you have accounts payable, accrued expenses, and deferred revenue. So accounts payable, this is just cash owed to suppliers, vendors who extended credit to the business. So maybe I'm a lemonade company and HEB extends me credit when I go and buy my inventory. They say, Carter, you can buy lemonade for us to sell and you don't have to pay us uh, until 30 days afterward. That would be accounts payable during those 30 days because I've received the lemonade but haven't actually paid them yet. Accrued expenses, these are operating expenses that have been incurred but not paid with in cash yet. So maybe I don't pay my rent for a year and my apartment's just really generous for some reason. That would be an accrued expense because I owe them. I've incurred this expense because I've been living in my apartment, but I haven't actually paid them yet. So it's an accrued expense. And in deferred revenue, this is a good or service owed to a third party for cash that they haven't already paid the business. So, you know, wait, sorry, a good or service owed to a third party for cash that they have already paid the business. So this is like unearned revenue. It's basically I'm getting prepaid. If I'm a business and I you know, have deferred revenue, this means someone's paying me cash up front for a good or service that I haven't actually fulfilled yet. So maybe someone pays me $100 for lemonade for the entire next year. I haven't actually sold them any lemonade yet. I haven't actually earned these dollars, but it's being prepaid to me by this third party. So this is unearned revenue as far as it relates to my business. I have not earned this revenue, but I've gotten the cash for it. And now that I owe them this good or service, so it's a liability for me. So we have net working capital, and then we have net operating working capital. And unlike with regular net working capital, it would be favorable for a business to have negative net operating working capital. Because this implies that a business receives cash for the goods or service before they have to pay their vendor. Um, so I'll talk about Amazon for an example here. Um, so Amazon has a very favorable net operating working capital. Amazon is such a big company and has, it operates so efficiently and has such good relationships with its vendors. That it actually receives cash from the inventory it sells before it actually pays the vendors that gave them that inventory. So for instance, let's say Amazon goes to a third party vendor 
to to buy shares. Maybe Amazon sells shares on their website. And maybe this third party vendor is like, hey, Amazon, I'm giving you these shares to sell. Um, pay me in 60 days for them. And Amazon's like, okay, that's a good deal. So maybe Amazon keeps those for 20 days on inventory and then they sell them to someone else. And then maybe that person pays Amazon 15 days from that, from then. So they received the chair 35 days ago and now they've already gotten the cash, but they don't actually have to pay the person that gave them that chair until 60 days from now. So they're receiving the cash from the chair before they even paid the person that gave them the chair. And you can see this is very favorable for Amazon because they're never really stretched for cash. A business that has the opposite scenario might always be trying to find cash to pay their vendors for the new products they're trying to buy. With Amazon, they're actually receiving the cash before they pay their vendors. So this is very favorable for them um, because it's purely your operating working capital. It doesn't involve cash or other non-operating assets. So um, another thing to note here is under cash flow from operations, we make adjustments to net income based off of the change in operating net working capital to reflect the cash that business has actually received. So I talked about how these, you know, um, net operating working capital items um, are created because of discrepancies between accrual basis accounting and cash basis accounting. And this must be reflected for on the cash flow statement. You know, for example, a business that has $200 in sales but had its accounts receivable increased by $200 would not have actually received any cash for those sales, even though the income statement implies it. The income statement is saying, hey, they got $200 in the revenue. But in reality, because accounts receivable increased by $200, that means none of that revenue was actually given them in cash. So that means this business certainly lost cash in this period, assuming you know they had some expenses because they didn't actually receive any cash for anything they did. It all turned into accounts receivable. So it's important to note here when we're like moving from the income statement to the cash flow statement, uh, you have to look at these discrepancies and uh, these net operating working capital line items are really showing them. So this is the formula. We have net income minus net operating working capital. This is part of the thing that helps us get to our actual cash flow from operations. Our net income is not actually showing the cash that's you know leaving and entering our business as a result of our operations because it's the accrual basis accounting. But here you, you can see you know cash flow from operations, the formula of it, uh, which I talked about last time, it's just net income plus depreciation because depreciation is non-cash and any other non-cash adjustments, which I'll talk about in future videos, minus accounts receivable, minus inventory, minus prepaid expenses, plus accounts payable, plus accrued expenses, plus deferred revenue. So as you can see here, there's kind of a pattern here where subtracting all the current assets and adding all the current liabilities. So, you know, why is this happening? Well, I guess we can just go through each one and I'll, I'll tell you why. So accounts receivable, this is a good or service that a business has delivered. Um, but not paid for yet. So when accounts receivable goes up, it must be subtracted because the business is not getting cash for the revenue they earn. The income statement is overstating cash flow, right? If, you know, <coughs> sorry, if um, my accounts receivable is going up, that means I've generated revenue, so my net income is higher, but I haven't actually gotten any cash for it. So my net income is overstating, you know, my actual cash flow. So I must subtract this accounts receivable. The opposite happens when accounts receivable goes down. It must be added because the business is getting cash for revenue that they earned in a previous period. So maybe in 2020, I provide a good service, but they don't. the person I provide it to doesn't pay me cash for it. So my accounts receivable is up $100. Um, but in 2021, they pay me that $100. Well, in 2021, I didn't actually generate you know, that good or service. So it won't show up as revenue on my income statement. However, I did receive cash for it. So I must increase, you know, I must add this to my cash flow from operations because it was cash flow generated directly from my operations. And as you can see here, all these line items are just occurring because of discrepancies between when cash, you know, was actually paid and when these expenses and revenues, you know, were incurred. So yeah. So as you can, this is kind of a good example here. And here's an example. So accounts receivable goes up by $10. So how does this affect our three statements? Well, this means that my business received $10 of revenue, but it was not paid for in cash. So my net income will go up by $10 because my revenue is increasing and just assume no tax rate here. And then the formula here, as I mentioned a few slides ago, we will subtract our accounts receivable. So our accounts receivable is up by $10. So it's 10 minus 10. So our net change of cash flow operations, our CFO is zero, which makes sense, right? Because if you just think about it like a five-year-old, 
I, you know, earned revenue, but I didn't actually get any cash from it. So I shouldn't actually have any cash flow, right? You know, my revenue did go up, but I didn't have any cash flow, no cash left or entered my business. So um, accounts receivable is up by 10. My current assets are up by 10, but my cash didn't change, right? My cash is zero, but my accounts receivable are up by 10. And my retained earnings is up by 10 as a result of my net income being up by 10. So you can see here, my assets equals my liabilities plus shareholders equity. I have no liabilities, they're zero, but my assets is up 10, my shareholders equity is up 10. So um, the balance sheet balances in this case. So you can see here, this formula works here. It helps us get to where the balance sheet is balancing. Here, we must subtract the accounts receivable because the income, net income is overstating our actual cash flow. In reality, if you just think about it like a five-year-old, no cash actually entered or left my business. Inventory, this is an item a business has paid for that it sells as a part of its core operations. And this shows up under COGS when a business sells the item. If I buy lemonade, if I'm a lemonade company, I buy lemonade inventory. As soon as I sell, as soon as I sell lemonade to a customer, the cost of it sold or whatever that lemonade cost me when I bought it from the store, like HEB or whatever. So this will show up under cost of goods sold when a business sells the item. But until I, uh, <coughs> sorry, until I actually sell this item, then it's not showing up on my income statement. If I go buy $5 million of lemonade, this is obviously cash that has left my business, but until I actually sell it, it's not showing up on my income statement. So when inventory goes up, it must be subtracted on the cash flow statement because this is cash that has left the business. I paid for the inventory, but it's not reflected on the income statement because it's not under cost of it sold until the business sells it. Opposite, when inventory goes down, it must be added on the cash flow statement because the cogs on the income statement were not paid in cash during that period. If I bought the inventory in the previous period, the lemonade, and then I sell it 10 years from now, 10 years from now, it's going to show up on the income statement as cogs. But in reality, I paid for those 10 years ago. So my cash flow shouldn't be decreasing. My net income would be understating my actual cash flow because it's showing these expenses that in reality were non-cash. So give a little example here. Let's say inventory goes down $10. Assume inventory was paid for in a previous period. This is an important assumption to make. I'll talk about it in a second. So COGS will go up by $10 because, you know, I sold the inventory. So my cost of goods sold are um, up by $10. Let's just assume that I uh, somehow sold it for $0 here. This is not a, you know, actual, um, like something that could have actually happened. But for the sake of the problem, let's assume our revenue was zero. Somehow we just sold lemonade for free. So COGS goes up by $10. So that income is down by 10 because we've incurred additional expenses. And then net income minus inventory. This goes back to the formula here, net income. We are subtracting inventory. It's a current asset. Like any other current asset, counts receivable inventory, prepaid expenses, we subtract it. So net income minus inventory. So we're going to have our negative 10 of net income minus our negative 10 of inventory. This double negative here means our cash flow for operations is zero. So this is showing that this inventory must be added back or, you know, you know double negatives must be added back under cash flow from operations because the business did not actually lose any cash during the period. So net chain in cash is zero, right? If you just think of this like a five-year-old, let's say I go and sell this computer mouse that I bought like three years ago. Well, in reality, you know, this thing cost me money. So that's going to be an expense on my income statement. But in reality, I didn't pay for that in this period. I paid for it like three years ago. So we must add this back on the cash flow statement to reflect actual like cash that is left and entered my business. So as far as the balance sheet goes, our inventory is down 10. So our assets are down 10. And then our retained earnings is down 10. So the balance is assets down 10, shares equity down 10. And then prepaid expenses, the last current asset. This is operating expenses, expenses a business has paid cash for, but not yet incurred. So when prepaid expenses goes up, it must be subtracted on the cash flow statement because the business has lost cash, but not incurred the expenses yet. The net income is overstating cash flow. If I prepay my entire apartment's rent for the entire 2023, well, that cash is certainly leaving my business, but I will not actually incur those expenses until 2023. So it's not gonna show up on my income statement, but it definitely did affect my cash flow because this cash left my business. And the opposite happens when prepaid expenses goes down. It must be added on cash flow statement because when the business actually incurred those expenses, it already paid the cash in the previous period. So if I prepay my rent for 2023, the entirety of 2023 
it's going to show up as have me having rent expenses. But in reality, I already paid for them. So my net income is actually being understated. My, it's understating my cash flow. You know, the net income, uh, which is just, it's reflecting accrual basis accounting, but cash flow is actually cash entering and leaving my business. And in this case, during 2023, I paid no rent. So, um, but the income statement shows that I, you know, incurred an expense because I actually lived in my apartment in 2023. So net income is reflecting what I'm actually incurring it, but I, I didn't actually, you know, pay any cash in 2023 for that rent. So here's an example, prepaid expenses goes up by 10. So no change in the income statement. This is important to note. There's going to be no changes in the income statement. These are all prepaid expenses. They're not expenses that I actually incurred during the period. I'm prepaying for them. So in the next period, maybe it'll show up on the income statement, but definitely not during this period. So it's going to be net income minus prepaid expenses. You're subtracting it because the current assets are to be zero minus $10. So um, our cash flow operations will be negative 10. So our CFO is down 10 because we pay dollars, $10 of cash. Again, if you think about it, like a five-year-old, I'm just paying my apartment $10. So just $10 of cash is definitely leaving my pocket. I'm not getting any cash, so ten, down $10. And then, um, so our cash is down $10, but our prepaid expenses are up 10, which is an asset. So our assets, one asset's down 10, one asset's up 10. So it balances, our assets are at zero. And then liabilities and showed exactly are you know, unaffected. So accounts payable, this is cash owed to suppliers and vendors who extended credit to the business. When accounts payable goes up, it must be added because the business did not pay cash. This is pretty intuitive, right? When accounts payable is going up, I'm not actually paying cash, so I need to uh, add it back. Opposite, when it goes down, it must be subtracted because the business paid cash. Accounts receivable is a bit weird because it's not so much a discrepancy between the income statement and the cash flow statement, but it's more so correcting uh, how we treat inventory. So example, let's say we buy $10 in inventory on account. Our inventory is going up by $10, which you would say, oh, inventory is going up by $10. We subtract that. So that's a cash outflow. But in reality, just think about it like a five-year-old, no cash is left in my business. I bought inventory on account, which means I didn't pay for it yet. So our inventory is going up by 10, which should reduce our cash flow for operations by 10, but we know this isn't possible. We add accounts payable, um, the $10 there. So net income is net income is unaffected, right, from this because we haven't actually sold the inventory yet. Um, and we haven't paid for it either, um, but that's not necessary. We haven't, we haven't sold the inventory yet, so it's not showing up on um, the income statement of the COGS. So CFO equals net income minus inventory because that's a current asset plus accounts payable because it's a current liability. So you have your zero, Minus ten dollars of inventory going up, plus ten of accounts payable um, going up. So you can see it's zero, which makes sense, right? Because no cash actually left or entered my business. So this is why that accounts payable needs to be added back. If we didn't add it back, then it would show that my business lost ten dollars because I'd be subtracting this inventory. But we know that this cannot be the case, right? Um, no cash has left my business, so it's important to always. Um, if accounts payable goes up to add it, if accounts payable goes down, we need to subtract it because that means we actually paid cash for this inventory, right? So we must um, subtract that um, to, sh to show my true cash flow. Accrued expenses, these are operating expenses that have been incurred but not paid with the cash yet. So when accrued expenses goes up, it shows up as an expense on the income statement was actually non-cash, so it must be added back. Um, when accrued expenses goes down, it must be subtracted because now the business paid for the expense that it previously incurred. So these make sense <coughs> intuitively, right? Um, if your credit expenses, they're just expenses you've incurred, but not paid for in ca in, within cash yet. So maybe I don't pay my entire rent for the year. While it will show up on the income statement as an expense because I've lived in my apartment, I haven't actually paid cash for it. It's a crude expense. So I must add this back to show my true cash flow. So an example, a crude expenses goes down $10. It's, it's easy to think, oh, this is going to be expect the income statement. It's expense. Well, actually, it's unaffected because no new expenses are incurred. When accrued expenses goes down 10, this means that expenses you've already incurred are actually being paid for in cash. So it's going to be your net income plus accrued expenses. But because your accrued, accrued expenses are going down 10, it's going to be zero plus this negative 10. So your cash flow for operations will be down 10. We are paying cash for expenses we previously incurred. So our cash is down 10 and then our accrued expenses are down 10. So it balances. And I think I forgot to say here, like as far as the balance sheet goes, inventory is up 10, our asset and our accounts payable is up 10, our liability 
so it bounces. Um, and here, yeah, cash is down 10, but your crew expenses and liability are down 10. So your assets and liabilities are both down, it bounces. So hopefully, you know, that makes sense. Lastly, deferred revenue. So this is a good or service owed to a third party for cash that they've already paid the business. So unearned revenue, right? You have been paid cash for a good or service you haven't provided to that third party. So an increase in deferred revenue must be added because the business is getting cash. This is pretty intuitive, right? If I get unearned revenue, that just means I'm getting cash, but it won't show up on the income statement because I haven't actually, you know, provided that good or service yet. So my net income is understating um my actual cash flow. And then a decrease in deferred revenue must be subtracted because the revenue that the business had earned during the period was paid to them in cash previously. If, <coughs> if my deferred revenue decreases, this means that revenue that was previously unearned becomes earned. So maybe um, I'm a lawnmower company and someone prepays me to mow them like 10 lawns the next year. They say, here, Carter, here's a hundred bucks. This is unearned revenue you're going to pay my lawn for the next six months. Then as, as I mow their lawns, my deferred revenue will go down and my actual revenue will go up because I'm earning the revenue. But I already got paid for it in cash. So while I'm earning this revenue during those six months, I'm not actually receiving any cash for it. So my net income is actually um, overstating my net income there. So let's do an example. Deferred revenue goes down $10. This means that the revenue that was previously unearned is now earned. Because, you know, while it was unearned, it, now it's down 10. So that means that I must have actually earned that revenue. I must have actually provided that good service. So this will increase my revenue by $10. Revenue on the income statement is showing when I'm actually performing good or services. So here, if it's now earned, it will go up by $10. So assuming 0% tax rate, my net income is up by 10. And then back to the formula, deferred revenue is a current liability. So we add it back. So it's going to be net income plus deferred revenue. So it's going to be 10 plus negative 10. So... Oh, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't write that there. It should be zero dollars. 10 plus negative 10 equals zero dollars because you're not actually receiving any cash. You're just performing this, you know, good or service that you owe to that third party. So um, your assets are unaffected, but your deferred revenue, this liability is down and then your retained earnings are up by 10. So your liabilities are down 10, your retained earnings are up 10. So this is zero cumulative and that equals your zero assets. So this balances. Um, that's all for this video. Sorry, my voice is a bit you know, messed up. I'm kind of sick. But uh, next time I'll talk more about long-term assets and some other you know, more complicated account, accounting nuances. But appreciate y'all watching. And uh, yeah, thank you.